Aloha. Welcome to Volcano Awareness Month for 2021. I'm David Phillips. I'm the acting scientist in charge of the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. So I'd like to start by saying a few words about the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. HVO is part of the US Geological Survey's Volcano Hazards Program. HVO's mission is to monitor, investigate, and assess hazards from active volcanoes and earthquakes in Hawaii, to issue warnings and to advance scientific understanding in order to reduce impacts of volcanic eruptions, communicating the results of our work to the public, emergency managers, and the scientific community is another important aspect of our mission. The HVO facilities at Uekahuna Bluff within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park were evacuated during the 2018 eruption. The main building on the bluff was damaged, and we are currently operating out of temporary facilities until new, new, until new buildings are constructed. Current plans call for a new primary USGS Science Center facility to be built in Hilo, as well as a smaller field station within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. We hope that these new facilities come online within the next several years. Besides working out of temporary facilities, at the present time, most of us are also teleworking uh, when we're not doing field work. Volcano Awareness Month was actually initiated back in 2010, primarily through the efforts of Janet Babb. Janet retired from HVO this past March, but Volcano Awareness Month lives on and has grown over the years. Activities typically include presentations by HVO staff given it in person at community centers throughout the Big Island, as well as HVO-led field trips. However, Volcano Awareness Month routine is a little different this year. Uh, first and foremost, all of our talks and even our field trips are virtual this year instead of in person, and this is because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So we, uh, we miss interacting with the community directly, and uh, we hope to do so again in the future. But for this year right now, we hope you find these HVO presentations enjoyable and informative. Second, HVO staff have also been pretty busy uh, responding to the current Kilauea eruption uh, that began on the evening of December 20th, 2020, and which continues to feed a lava lake within Hale Ma'u Ma'u. Uh, the response to this uh, eruption uh, compressed activities related to Volcano Awareness Month uh, down to Volcano Awareness Week. Um, but we're getting these out now, and um, we hope that, uh, that you will find them informative and interesting. Um, and we hope that they provide some additional insights about uh, what's happening with the current eruption uh, as well as in general about the past, present, and future of volcanic activity in Hawaii. So we have three virtual talks planned, uh, focusing on Kilauea and Mauna Loa volcanoes. We have recorded conference presentations from December's American Geophysical Union Conference. And we even have a virtual hike at Kilauea Summit with Don Swanson. The hike uh, with Don was always one of the highlights of Volcano Awareness Month. Um, and so this, this virtual uh, field trip uh, made possible thanks to Don um, and the recording by Katie Mulliken is, uh, is not to be missed, so that's great. So without further ado, let's uh, start the festivities with this uh, roughly one hour long presentation about what's happening at Kilauea Volcano. And I will turn it over to my fellow HBO colleagues to give you updates on the geology, the gas geochemistry, the ground deformation, and the seismology. Mahalo. My name is Matthew Patrick. I'm a geologist at Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and I'll be talking about some of the geologic observations of the ongoing summit eruption at Kilauea uh, that HVO has been making. Uh, the eruption has been going on about a month now. This is a view of Kilauea caldera, and in the southwest corner, we have Hale Ma'u Ma'u crater, and this is where the active lava lake has been. And this thermal map we'll be talking about later what these colors represent. 
But it's important to realize that if you go back just three years ago, Hale Ma'u Ma'u looked very different. Um, this is before the, the very large eruption that we had in 2018. So before 2018, we had Hale Ma'u Ma'u crater here. It's very circular, about six tenths of a mile across and pretty shallow, just 80 to 90 yards deep. And we had this lava lake that had been active for about um, a decade. But then in 2018, we had this very large eruption on the lower flank of the uh, volcano on the lower east rift zone that drained magma from the summit magma chamber at a very high, high rate. And it caused the caldera floor and, Hale, and the floor of Hale Ma'u Ma'u to collapse. And so uh, this is what it looked like after that. So you can see big changes at the summit here. Um, the floor of Hale Ma'u Ma'u collapsed, uh, dropped more than 500 yards. So a really significant distance. And you can see big changes to the topography of, of the other parts of the caldera floor. And what's also really interesting is in uh, the summer of 2019, we started to see water seep into that very deep uh, pit. And that uh, water lake, uh, which is really unprecedented for the past 200 years, uh, was there right up until the current eruption. So I think the other talks uh, are, will mention some of the um, activity that happened before the eruption. Uh, but at least on the surface, there really wasn't uh, any change, any detectable change in, say, the temperature of the water lake or, or, uh, or hot steam cracks appearing, let's say. Um, there really wasn't indica any indication of that. So uh, the magma you know, came up to the surface uh, pretty quick. And my for me personally, the first indication that I got uh, of the eruption was an automated alert on my smartphone uh, because we have this thermal camera that's running and it has an algorithm that kind of detects, you know, anomalously high temperatures. And I got an alert um, at dinner time saying, hey, there's, uh, there could be lava, as you can see here. And, you know, in this case, the computer was actually right. So, um, and then, so, you know, we all obviously, um, uh, headed out in the field, uh, start our work. So HVO geologists got to Jagger Museum Overlook about 1030, and what we could see was this enormous, just towering steam plume. And we could, you know, it was pretty obvious that this was that water lake being boiled off, presumably by lava that was, you know, pouring into the bottom of the crater. Um, yeah, this steam plume was really impressive, and actually, um, Somewhat similar, um, we happened to be down um, in the 2018 Lower East Rift Zone eruption when we saw Green Lake uh, in Kapoho Crater boil off, uh, another you know towering steam plume. But it's important to realize that that water lake um, was quite large, was boiled off in just about an hour and a half. So on that first night around 11, we got to the western caldera rim, and this is what we saw. So this is the first view in Hale Ma Ma. and uh, we could see here numerous fissures, uh, fountains that were active, and they were all pouring lava into the bottom of the crater. The water lake is gone at this point. It's about 11 p.m. And what we have is the development of and growth of a lava lake. A closer view of that um, dominant uh, fountaining source on the north side of the crater. It's about 50 yards high. And you can see it's producing this uh, really uh, vigorous cascade of lava that's just pouring and plunging into the lake. So at first light, you know, we flew and we were able to get kind of the first daytime views of, of this eruption. And you can see the lava is uh, filling in the bottom of the crater, but then there's also this island. Um, and this, you know, close later looks um, of this island seem to reveal that this was a kind of a ejecta that may have been formed in the initial stages when lava was pouring into the lake, a water lake, and um, creating maybe small explosions. But still, we, we don't have um, hand samples or, uh, or you know, close views of the lake, so it's still, its origin is still a little bit enigmatic. But you can see on this first day, we see, um, uh, first morning, we can see lava from the fountains pouring into the lake and filling in the bottom of the crater. So this is a, a time lapse uh, taken from the thermal camera um, looking in Hale Ma'u Ma'u, um, and it starts off with the water lake here. 
and we'll see the whole month of the eruption just in this sequence. So I'm going to start it and boom. So there is the start of the lava lake and you can see it rises and fills the bottom very quickly. We have this fountain on the north side and then that dies off and the fountain fountaining switches to the western fissure here. And throughout this time you can see this island, this cold island is kind of shifting around, um, presumably carried by the currents um, in the lake. And you also see these minor islands that are active in the east part of the lake. Again, I should say that we're looking towards the east. So this area here, the top of the image is the east and the bottom of the image is the west. And then you can see around January 8th, the eastern side of the lake starts to be kind of abandoned or starts to crust over and solidify. And the active lava on the surface is really just limited to the western part of the lake. Watch that again. So here we have this rapid emplacement of the lake, of the lava lake. We have this northern fissure that's active. We have this island that's moving around in the currents. Then we have the shift to the western fissure here at the bottom of the image. And then we'll start to see, uh, we'll st just a little bit, we'll start to see the eastern side of the lake start to solidify. This happens around the 8th of January. So then we have active lava that's more or less limited to the western part of the lake here. Okay, so that's kind of the, the state of what we have now. And you know, in the, in the past week or so, we've seen some minor changes in the vent activity at this western fissure, which is the active vent area. We see occasional small collapses that can trigger kind of minor switches in the vent location or crusting over of the channel. Um, but overall, relatively minor, the western fissure remains active. So one of the things that we track when we go out is, um, is the elevation of the lava lake. And this is important because we have the, we know the uh, topography of Haleamau Crater before the eruption. So by comparing the elevation of the lake uh, to the pre-eruption topography, we can figure out the volume and also the eruption rates. We use the laser rangefinder for that. Anyway, this is the results of all that data that HVO geologists have collected over the past month. And you can see this initial, uh, this is the depth of the lake in meters, so you know, roughly yards. And you can see the um, rapid rise or filling of the lake um, in the initial days, and then it kind of slows down. Um, and we've ha been at this kind of slower rate um, in the past few weeks. Right now, it's, it's, uh, the lake is roughly 200 meters deep or about 650 feet deep. That's pretty deep. Um, you know, if you go online, you can find points of comparison here. The closest one I could find is a Space Needle in Seattle. I've never been there, but it's about 184 meters. So the lake is, is deeper than um, the Space Needle is tall. The volume is about 30 million cubic meters. So and that might not be necessarily very intuitive, but uh, point of comparison, again, the 10,000 uh, Olympic swimming pools. Um, and uh, I've never been to the Great Pyramid of Giza, as another, uh, but uh, I've always imagined it as a place that's uh, uh, really enormous. And uh, this lava lake is almost 13 times the volume of, of that. Pretty impressive. So this is another view of that map of the summit caldera. And we have, uh, this is the most recent thermal map that was made. And we have, again, in the southwest portion of the caldera, we have Haleamau'amau crater. And we have this lava lake that's filling up a you know, portion of that crater. And this is a thermal map. So it, the colors here, the blue to the yellows to the reds, show uh, give a sense of the temperature on the surface. And uh, the blues that you see this eastern portion here uh, is cooler and it's actually solidified and the active lava here uh, the hotter temperatures or the hotter colors are limited to the western side so as of uh, today january 20th the eruptive activity is stable uh, we have seen um, a, there's been a little bit of deflation over the past day and that's uh, associated with a, a slight decrease in the vigor of the eruption um, we've seen this pattern before. We've seen how when we have these uh, small deflation phases, they're uh, followed by uh, 
inflation. So the uh, eruptive activity can then pick up again. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how um, the eruption develops over the next few days uh, with this kind of deflation inflation cycle. But of course, the bigger question is how will the eruption play out in the long run overall? Of course, Hale Ma'u is, is the home of Pele, and this is very fitting because Hale Ma'u has such a long history of lava lake activity. We've had, uh, there were decades, well, almost 100 years of lava lake activity in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, this is an example of one of the beautiful perched lava lakes that were formed in Hale Ma'u. And of course, we had 10 years of continuous lava lake activity from 2008 to 2018. But what we've seen is that, you know, these previous eruptions at Halemama, there's, a, there's a, a wide range in eruption durations. They can last for a day or they can last for decades. Uh, so it's still unclear how long uh, this eruption will last. There's no indication of it stopping, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to last as long as these previous eruptions. In any case, we're watching this very closely. Um, we're out in the field on a daily basis. We have a very robust monitoring network that's keeping a very close eye on the eruption. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Trisha Nadeau, and I will be giving you a bit of an update on what the gases have been doing during this recent Kilauea eruption. So before we get to what it's doing now, I'll give you a little bit of background on what the gas was doing before the eruption. So as many of you might know already, SO2 emissions, or sulfur dioxide, were very, very low since the 2018 eruption. Um, and that meant all eruptive sites. We were measuring about 30 tons a day at the summit, but sites on the East Rift Zone were below detection. And what that means is that magma was deep enough to keep that SO2 dissolved. Um, so just like a bottle of soda that you might open, we essentially had the cap on our magma chamber. So no bubbling, no gases leaking out. Um, until the eruption. We did also have this water lake that you can see on the right, and it is possible that some SO2 that was escaping from the magma ended up dissolved in the lake water, so we couldn't measure it in uh, the atmosphere. Now people might also be wondering if we saw anything in the degassing before the eruption that could have been a clue that an eruption was coming. And that's a fair question because you do see signals like that at many volcanoes around the world, and we've even seen it at Kilauea in the past. This is sulfur dioxide emission right here um, for a lot of 2007. So this is the lead up to the 2008 eruption. And you can see that sulfur emissions were pretty low uh, and pretty stable at only a few hundred tons of SO2 per day until we hit December of 2007 when we started seeing this increase. Now, nothing was erupting here yet, but we were seeing an increase. And then in the middle of March of 2008, that's when the eruption started. So here, seeing that increase of SO2 was a clue that there could have been an eruption coming, and it did come. This time we didn't see that. So this is a slightly different kind of unit. This is SO2 concentration. This is measured at a site about a kilometer uh, downwind of Hale Ma'umau, and it measures about half an hour every three hours. So you can see this is the day of the eruption, zero, 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 all zeros. The eruption happened right about 9.30, just after our nine o'clock sampling window. We didn't see any change, even though the eruption was about to start. You can see that the station definitely did measure more SO2 after that once the eruption had started, but no precursors this time around. No, no SO2 showed up to clue us in that something was happening. And now for gas emissions since the eruption started, this is back to SO2 emission rate again, and this graph starts the day the eruption started. And you can see right away, we were we were pretty high with SO2 emission rates. This is almost 40,000 tons per day of SO2. It did start to decrease right away. Um, and for context here, we sort of crossed through this zone where we had um, lava lake, the previous lava lake level was. Um, so early in that emission, uh, early in that eruption, SO2 emissions uh, around 2008 were close to 20,000 tons a day. So we started higher than the previous lava lake, crossed down through that, 
And then most of the 20, uh, 2008 to 2018 lava lake averaged around 5,000 tons per day. And we actually did, with this new eruption, see that for a while. We're a little bit lower than that right now, um, although there is variability. Um, so we had this one point jump back up to almost uh, 5,000, but our most recent point is 2,500. So in general, we're slightly lower than emissions from the previous lava lake. People may also be wondering about Pu'uo'o. Um, we did go check on it. We took a helicopter out there on January 7th to make sure that there was no excess degassing out there. And there's not. SO2 remains below detection limits around Pu'uo'o. These sort of rainbow dots are measurements from along our flight track. And if there was a significant degassing plume, you would see all of the red dots concentrated in one place. But you don't. You see it's just noisy data. There's blues and reds and yellows all over the place. So that's telling us there's essentially no plume coming out of Pu'uo in terms of sulfur dioxide. What is out there is a little bit of H2S, so hydrogen sulfide, and human noses are actually more sensitive to hydrogen sulfide than they are to SO2. So even though there's just a tiny amount of that hydrogen sulfide, if the winds change and blow that gas toward nearby communities, people may smell a rotten egg smell. So that's not SO2, that's H2S, and it's only under certain wind conditions. We can also see SO2 emissions from space. So TROPOMI is a satellite sensor that detects SO2 once a day. And you can see in this image from the day before the eruption, there's no plume. This is just background noise. Once we had the eruption, we see a, a, a pretty big plume on December 22nd. But already by uh, the 25th, by Christmas, we were having a bit of a decrease. There's less of a plume. And since then, we've had even less. It's certainly still detectable by satellite, but it is lower emissions than early in the eruption. So it's showing the same decrease in emissions that we've been seeing from our ground-based measurements. People who may visit the national park or live here on the island of Hawaii may be wondering about gas hazards. And if you've lived here long enough, you likely know all about VOG. So the VOG is back, unfortunately, and it can be a hazard. But as I mentioned, the emission rates right now are actually a bit lower, just a little lower than that 2008 to 2018 Lava Lake level of emissions. And there's actually much less VOG than there was during the 2018 eruption that released far more SO2 than we're measuring right now. So the VOG is not as bad as during that eruption. If people are wondering more about VOG, you can head to this website called the VOG dashboard. And there you can get information from the Hawaii Department of Health about how the VOG and the SO2 might affect your health. You can get forecasts about where the VOG will go on any given day. And that's what this image on the right is showing. And you can also get real-time air quality data if you're curious about uh, whether the VOG is near you uh, at any given time. So I've talked a lot about just sulfur dioxide, but we can actually monitor other gases in some other ways. Um, so one of the ways we get a better picture of gas chemistry is by unoccupied aircraft system or drones, as most people call them. So we have permission from the National Park Service to do some of those gas measurement flights within the park. And this picture on the left is just showing sort of a slice through the plume. And the red is where we encountered sulfur dioxide. And I could have also just as easily put this profile showing where we encountered carbon dioxide or hydrogen sulfide. And then on the right is showing where the gas concentrations were highest when we flew actually in and over the erupting crater. Um, so that's a place that we cannot go ourselves but that's where the drones come in handy. They can go places that we can't. So we are able to measure the chemistry right in the erupting plume, right close to the vent. We can also get gas chemistry using what's called infrared spectroscopy. So there we don't have to go so close to the vent. We can just measure the gas that's in between our infrared source, which when there's an eruption, we can use lava as our infrared source and our spectrometer. We can also just physically go grab some of the gas and send it off to the lab to analyze the chemistry. So again, we can't go in the erupting crater to do any of this, but there are some degassing sites in public areas of the National Park at Sulphur Banks. 
So we do this sort of sampling with this bottle to sample the gases every three months anyway, and we added some extra sampling uh, because we had an eruption. Now, we can learn things about the eruption by looking at the gas chemistry and the combinations of gases. So both of our multi-gas sensors, meaning our ground-based station and our drone-mounted multi-gas sensors, plus that infrared spectroscopy, all of those methods are telling us the same thing. There's a low ratio of carbon dioxide to sulfur dioxide. So sulfur dioxide is dominating the degassing during this eruption. And what that means is that this lava that's erupting right now sat around in a magma chamber for a while before it erupted. So like in this top panel, if we had brand new magma coming right up from deep in the mantle, all of its dissolved carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide would all come out during this one eruption. And that would mean there's a higher proportion of carbon dioxide or a higher C to S ratio. But we don't see that. So we're actually down in the second picture here where the magma comes up, sits in a magma chamber for a while. And while it's sitting there, it is able to lose or degas some of that carbon dioxide. It just comes up without erupting. It leaks out through cracks in the ground. And then once it finally does erupt, we end up with that sulfur dioxide coming out. So that's what we see right now. So the gas chemistry is telling us that the lava that's erupted so far in this eruption did not come quickly from deep in the mantle. This is magma that was sitting in a magma chamber for a while. So it's sort of pre-degassed. It lost its carbon dioxide already. So that's one of the things that gas chemistry has shown us. We still have a lot of data to look at and interpret and understand. And we will certainly keep making measurements, both for these sorts of chemistry issues that we can figure out and to make sure we're keeping an eye on hazards for all of you in the public. Thanks for listening. My name is Ingrid Johansson. I'm a geophysicist with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and I'm going to talk about deformation during the December 2020 eruption at Kilauea Volcano and show you some of the data that we collected during that time. First, I want to introduce you to two of the data types that I'm going to show. Uh, these are the primary ways in which we monitor the volcano uh, in real time, at, at least uh, via deformation measurements. Uh, the first is continuous GPS. The GPS antenna is underneath this gray dome here. It's fixed firmly to a monument, which is itself fixed firmly to the ground. It operates not too dissimilarly from the GPS in your phone or in your car, but instead of measuring the position of something that's freely moving around, we're very precisely tracking the change of position of the ground to which this antenna is attached. The other instrument is a borehole tilt meter, which is this long cylinder here. Inside this cylinder are two bubble levels, uh, one oriented north-south, the other oriented east-west. These so are not too different from bubble levels you might have used around your own house, except that they're extremely sensitive, capable of measuring tilt down to a fraction of a microradian. And for comparison, one microradian is about 50 millionths of a degree. So very, very small amounts of tilt. These cylinders are lowered down into a hole uh, where they're kept a little bit protected from uh, temperature changes and other uh, noise sources at the surface. When magma starts to move into a reservoir, it bulges the ground above it. This has the effect of uh, tilting the surface outward uh, and moving points on the ground up and, and outward from the magma reservoir. So this is what we're measuring and, and how we're interpreting these data. Uh, when an eruption happens, taps into that uh, magma reservoir, moves material out of it, and we see the opposite type of motion. So now um, the ground is moving downward on top of the uh, magma reservoir, uh, tilt is, the ground is tilting inwards, and, and points on the surface are moving down and inwards towards the magma reservoir. So here we're now looking at three tilt meter plots for tilt meters 
around the summit, UWE, SDH, and IKI. Uh, this is a, a map of Kilauea's summit uh, showing the locations of these tilt meters. Here's UWE at the Uekuhuna Vault, SDH at Sand Hill, and IKI uh, near Kilauea Iki. These plots are showing 12 hours of data around the onset of the December 20th eruption. Uh, you'll see two lines here, blue line and a green line. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the tilt meters have two bubble levels, uh, north-south and east-west, but we often find it convenient to mathematically rotate those uh, into different azimuths in order to emphasize different signals. So for example, uh, the blue line here for UWE has been rotated to 310 uh, degrees, and this emphasizes deformation from the shallow Holly Mountain Mountain Reservoir. Uh, and, and this direction has been chosen specifically so that downward motion of this blue line is consistent with deflationary type motion and upward uh, movement of the line would be consistent with inflationary motion. And the same is true for SDH and IKI, even though they're rotated to different azimuths, those azimuths were chosen such that upward motion of the blue line is consistent with uh, inflation and downward is consistent with deflation of that shallow Holly Mountain Mountain Reservoir. Uh, if the source is, is different, then we can expect uh, different patterns of, of tilt that might not all resolve onto the blue line. We first started seeing changes in tilt on December 20th at about 8.30 p.m. Uh, this was only an hour before the fissure opened at around 9.30. So you can see this period, this about this period of um, one hour prior to the eruption, uh, we saw a mix here of deflationary and inflationary motion. A somewhat complicated pattern was probably uh, caused by the opening of the fissures. After the onset of eruption, uh, we see on, on all of our summit tilt meters um, data that's very consistent with just gradual steady deflation of the shallow Holly Mountain Mountain Reservoir. It's interesting to note that um, the changes here prior to the eruption were very modest, only a couple microradians. Uh, it was actually not enough to trip our tilt alarms. So that this was an event that happened um, with very little precursory deformation. Uh, it did trip other alarms. So it was the swarm alarms and the thermal alarm that really alerted us to what was going on. Uh, you might be interested to know that you know, the spike that you can see on, on several of these tilt meters, um, this is when the magnitude 4.4 uh, earthquake on the south flank occurred. And what's happening here, these, these are really noise. What's happening is uh, the shaking from that event really sets up sloshing in the bubble level. In the days following the onset of the December 20th eruption, we continued to see uh, steady deflationary motion. Uh, this plot is showing uh, GPS positions for station CALM. CALM is located uh, centrally in Kilauea Caldera on what we call the down drop block. This plot is showing its vertical motion. So you can see it moved very steadily downward following the onset of the eruption, uh, but then had a change in behavior uh, on around December 26. This was when the, the north vent in uh, Holly Mountain Low Crater was drowned by the lava lake. After this time period, saw a little bit of uplift, um, but overall deformation was much lower amplitude uh, following December 26 than it was in the days before. So with nice time series like this, we can start to model the decay using different kinds of curves. In this case, I fit an exponential curve to this time series. Uh, we can do this for all of the GPS stations around the summit region and come up with a sense of the, the spatial pattern of this deflationary component, which is what I'm showing in this plot. So these arrows are representing the amplitude of an exponential curve fit to the time series uh, for all of these GPS stations in Kilauea summit region. The size of the arrow corresponds with the magnitude of the exponential, how, how much 
uh, deformation happened. And, and here's the key here. And the direction uh, indicates the, the direction that this um, uh, exponential decay was oriented towards. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the vectors here in the summit are all pointing inwards, very consistent with deflation of a source uh, here in, in the summit, which um, could very well be the, the shallow Holly Mountain Elm source. There's a little bit of asymmetry here in the sizes of the arrows, which might indicate something more complicated uh, than just a simple sphere here at the summit. One of the interesting observations from this eruption was um, the, the observation of, of contraction out into the East Rift Zone. So here I, I've expanded the, the size of the map to show uh, GPS stations out around the East Rift. So you can see some inward direction motion up here around Makapui Crater, uh, and also some motion here near Pu'uo'o where uh, stations are being drawn up rift. This is a, a unique observation. This hasn't been observed in other events that have also caused deflation uh, at Kilauea summit, uh, with the exception of 2018, where there was deformation all over the volcano. Um, what this might mean is that uh, magma may have actually been drawn uh, backwards out of the rift uh, into the summit. Uh, typically what happens is that magma comes first up to the summit and then is transported down the rift. Um, but this might be telling us that in some cases, in fact, um, uh, magma can, can flow backwards and be, be drawn from the rift back into the summit, which would be a, an interesting and unique observation. I should point out that, that uh, no contraction or inflationary type motions were observed downrift of Pu'uo'o including uh, at the site of the, the 2018 eruption. So uh, these data, the GPS stations in these areas uh, didn't show anything that, that looked clearly related to uh, the December 20th eruption. So now I'm looking at the, a tilt plot again. This is again the, the UWE tilt meter, uh, which is the Ue Kahuna vault, not that far from Jagger Museum. Here we're looking at two months of tilt in order to put the eruption of December 20th in context of what happened after and what happened before. So you can see here at December 20th, in the days after until the drowning of the North Bent, there's about 50 microradians here of, of deflationary motion. Since December 26th, we've seen modest inflation and deflation, but um, much lower rates overall. Prior to December 20th, uh, we saw a lot of these events where there'd be deflation and then inflation. We call these DI events, deflation inflation events, and they are extremely common at Kilauea's summit. So in fact, these DI events are, are part of the background activity at Kilauea. But the, the most uh, prominent signal prior to December 20th was this inflationary signal uh, on uh, December 2nd. This was associated with a small magma intrusion in the southern portion of Kilauea caldera. So it's worth pointing out that, that this intrusion happened in a different part of the caldera than the eruption. And so it's unlikely that the eruption is actually tapping into the magma from the intrusion. Uh, instead, it's more likely that both the intrusion and the eruption are being fed from a slightly deeper, uh, more central reservoir. The size of this tilt excursion, as you can see, is about 20 microradians. Both of these events dwarf are dwarfed by the 2018 eruption and collapse signals. Uh, during that time period, uh, we recorded tilt changes over three months uh, of on the order of 600 microradians. So still compared to what happened in 2018, you know, which was a, a centuries level event, um, these are relatively modest. Now we're zooming out to the past year of tilt data, tilt from tilt meter UWE at the top, and then a vertical motion from GPS station CALM at the bottom. Uh, you can see in the tilt record 
the repeated DI events, which are very common at the summits. Um, you can also start to see this, this steady, slow inflationary deformation. This actually started uh, not long after the end of the 2018 eruption and has been, uh, this signal has been very typical of the summit in, in the years since. Uh, you can see that here at CALM as well, where the station was slowly moving upwards uh, throughout 2020. And th this sort of gives you an idea of what a departure both the intrusion and the eruption were from the pattern that had been established uh, in the previous year. The, the sizes of the motions that we have seen in the last month and a half um, can maybe be compared to tilt changes that were observed in the 60s and 70s. So in the era before uh, the Pu'uo eruption started, um, there were eruptions at multiple locations throughout Kilauea volcano um, that would cause deflation at the summit. Um, this record here is from um, a water tube tilt meter. So this is the era before borehole tilt meters, before GPS. So tilt during this time was recorded um, using an instrument called a water tube tilt meter. And those of you who have been to Jagger Museum uh, may remember that this was on display there. Um, this was read manually once per day, which is what gives us this nice continuous two decade long record. Um, however, so you can see here uh, many instances, uh, the scale goes from minus 400 to 400, many instances of 100 micro rad, 50 micro rad type uh, motions, both deflationary and sometimes inflationary. Um, what this means is that it, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that as we go into the future, we may see more events similar to um, the eruption on December 20th. Um, we're still learning, you know, what this new regime at Kilauea Volcano is going to be like, and this era of the 60s and 70s might be um, uh, what we're moving into. So to summarize, Throughout the December eruption, we saw deformation consistent with that summer reservoir deflating, magma moving out and feeding the eruption in Halimau Crater. We also observed contraction in the nearby portions of the East Rift Zone. And this was a, a unique observation that suggested that magma might have actually been flowing backwards towards the summit. Uh, overall, the levels, levels of deformation were low compared to 2018, but not too different from what was observed in the 60s and 70s. So we're continuing to learn how Kilauea volcano is different and similar to um, the Pu'uo'o era, uh, and, and very much looking back at previous times in Kilauea's history in order to learn what we might be moving into. Thanks. My name is Peter Dotre, and I'm a seismologist here at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. And I'm here today to talk to you about the most recent seismic activity, uh, so the activity over the past month, and we'll focus on some of the events that led up to and occurred during the December 20th uh, Kilauea summit eruption. So first we'll take a look at this island uh, map um, of the earthquake locations, and you can see um, they're colored based on depths and size based on their magnitudes. And you can really see some of these seismogenic regions that we're used to um, seeing being very active continue to be quite active over the past month. Um, so here we have the East Rift South Flank activity um, that's been occurring. And then we can focus on Mount Oloa and the Northwest Flank. Uh, and then Kaawiki Fault System continues to stay very active. And then, of course, this deep Pahala activity that has been very prevalent um, over the past couple of years. Uh, we'll dig into that a little bit as well. And then we'll focus on this activity at Kilauea Summit. Um, and you can see here it looks very quiet. And we'll talk about what we're seeing there and, and maybe why it's, it's been quiet over this past month period. Um, and then over here to the left, we have a histogram. So this is a two-year plot, um, a bar graph that shows you the number of earthquakes per week. So each bar is a single week, and it's showing you the number of earthquakes. So up here, we, you know, we had a week of island-wide seismicity of over 1,000 counts, and then the next week we dropped down below 600. And we'll take a look at a lot of other histograms as well. 
Um, so these histograms are actually focused just on Kilauea Summit. Um, so this is activity at Kilauea Summit over the past two years. And you can see these weekly counts really fluctuate and Kilauea is very dynamic. So it's expected. We have weeks of swarms and then the next week will be uh, event counts under 100 in a week. October 20th to January um, 18th activity. Uh, we can see there's a few spikes here. So now we're actually looking at earthquakes per day. So each bar is a single day. And you can see there's a few spikes here in late October, late November, and then this uh, little spike with a drop off uh, in mid-December. Um, so we'll take a look at those independently. Um, so first, that first little spike, here's the video of that activity. And you'll notice there's a couple of episodes of a lot of earthquakes that focus up in these lower Kaawiki faults. Um, we call these the Namakani Pio um, swarms. And a swarm of earthquakes is just a group of earthquakes that occur very closely in space and time. Namakani Pio swarms because um, on this density plot that they occur very close to the Namakani Pio campgrounds. Um, and here this density plot is showing you different squares of concentrations of earthquakes in that square. So your cooler colors are going to be lower concentrations while your warmer colors are higher concentrations. So you can see we have some of these uh, grids of these warm dark reds, which are very high counts of earthquakes. Um, so most of that swarm was occurring right there on these lower Kaawiki faults. And again, this is that first spike we were looking at in these daily um, counts. And if we take a different look at this same swarm, uh, now we're looking at this histogram, which is earthquakes per hour over this two day period. And you can see it really flared up right after midnight um, and it produced the highest rate of earthquakes at 25 earthquakes in an hour before it really quieted down and then picked up for its second episode. And if we come over here and look at this map, so this map is now showing you um, colors based on time. So your cooler colors actually happened early on October 22nd, while your warmer colors were more on October 24th. Um, and sized based on magnitudes, again, you can see this large earthquake right here it was a magnitude 3.5. Um, and this map has these depth panels, so these longitudinal and longitudinal depth panels. And you can think of those as just if we took a slice out of this map and were able to look north at the um, at the uh, sort of subsurface activity, we would see where these events are occurring, which is a great way to look at where the depths are clustering. And you can see here, um, so these are the same events all looking at different views. And the latitude, again, is we're going to cut this way and look west. And this is what you'd be seeing. And you can see these events all really cluster in this two to four kilometer depths. Um, and this is in regards to sea level. So two to four kilometers below sea level. And you can see both of these episodes um, very concentrated right there. And at these depths and in these Kaawiki faults, um, we expect these events um, as the, there's some stress redistributions between the Kilauea volcano and the Mauna Loa volcano. Um, two volcanoes pressed up against each other and produce all these faults. Um, and that activity is, is it occurs there relatively often. Um, and now we'll jump into this um, second spike that we were looking at, uh, which is more sort of focused in the Kilauea caldera uh, and Upper East Rift. You'll see a lot of activity in this Upper East Rift connector. So you see a little flare up there, some activity, and then it'll sort of focus in the southeastern part of the caldera before a few large events occur on this Upper East Rift connector. And if we sort of take that same look we are looking at the Namakani Pio swarms and, and look at it for these um, caldera swarms, um, we're going to look at this density plot again. Now, this is a slightly longer time span, November 29th to December 3rd, but we can see again some of these darker colors are occurring in uh, where most of the earthquakes were concentrated, which was the southeastern part of the caldera and this western part of the caldera. Uh, with some blues and greens, these moderate colors uh, forming on this the downdrop block, so the shelf of the caldera that fell um, during the 2018 eruption, and a lot of activity up here in this Upper East Rift connector, as we saw in that video. Um, and now we'll go take another look at, at these histograms, these hourly histograms, but to see this swarm really had two episodes as well. You had this first episode flare up um, and it peaked out about at 17 earthquakes in an hour and then it quieted down and then it picked up again. And this time it, it topped out at um, 23 earthquakes in an hour before it really fell off. Um, 
And again, these are colored based on the time. So cooler colors are earlier, warmer is later, and they're size based on magnitude. So you have this large 3.1 event right here. Um, and this map is interesting because you see the colors are actually quite separate. You can see these blue, these early episodes happen in this downdrop block in the western part of the caldera. Uh, before you get these oranges and yellows in the Upper East Rift connector, and then finally it moved into these darker reds up here in the, the southeastern part of the caldera. And we'll take a look at these longitudinal and latitudinal depth panels. Again, if we cross cut and look in, uh, you can see these depths are actually quite a bit more shallow. We're looking at about zero to one and a half to two uh, kilometers below sea level. Um, and these uh, swarms really had different implications with, with the shallow depths and them occurring right under the caldera. Uh, along with some geodetic signals we are seeing with this second uh, episode especially, uh, these are believed more to have um, be results of, of some shallow magma intrusions under the volcano, um, and, and uh, which is very different from those Namakani pile storms, which, which was really more just stress redistribution on some faults. Uh, this had some more um, magmatic implications. Um, and then finally, about a... a um, a month, not quite a month later, we have this um, eruption activity. So this is a longer time span video, and you're going to see it builds up. There's just some micro seismicity, really nothing obvious until the day of the eruption. We get a little flare right there, and then we get this large south flank event that I think most of us felt on the east side of the island. And then a very interesting part of this video actually is after a few days after the eruption began, activity got very, very quiet. You see occasional micro seismic events popping up, but for the most part, time is still running. And I mean, the map, it, it looks empty. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit of why we're seeing such uh, little uh, earthquakes at the summit and, and what we are seeing uh, since the eruption began. So again, we'll take a look at this final little um, spike and the drop off, which occurred, you know, the eruption began on the 20th, uh, through the night and, and early December 21st. And you can see on this density plot, you have a very different scale, only one to four, mostly light blues with just a couple of these warm colors occurring on the south uh, part of the caldera on this sort of this ring fault around and still some upper east rift, connect, uh, east rift connector activity as well. And so now I'm actually going to show a slightly different view. So here we're looking at waveforms from different stations, which I've highlighted on this map um, to get nice coverage around the caldera. And this map is, is still the, the earthquakes are color based on time, size based on magnitude. And this plot down here is slightly different because we're showing depth in regards to time. So this is no longer a cross cutting view, simply where the depths were, were occurring over time. And you can see this red dotted line is when lava uh, was seen at the surface, when it broke the surface. And up to uh, before that, and even after that, we have this slight shallowing of located activity, which would make sense. Even after lava breaks the surface, the, the, the conduit and the, the path that the magma is taking is still trying to um, establish itself and sort of get a, a stable path that it can uh, pour lava out of. Um, so we see some of this shallowing later as well. And so now we'll focus on some of these waveforms. Um, but I actually want to sh shift this view to spectrogram view. So there's the same stations, the same time, except now we're looking at the frequency content. Uh, so you can see some of these darker colors um, are the events, these darker reds, I mean. And the darker the red and the more red you see, you're generally the stronger the events. Um, so you can see sort of this hour leading up to the eruption, we have these, these spikes, these sort of broadband, you know, they have low frequencies and then up to 20, 25 hertz high frequencies, these broad signals that are really signature of, of earthquakes, you know, rock breaking rock, fracturing. Um, you can see some of these high frequencies attenuate over time, which is very classic for any sort of volcano tectonic earthquake. I mean, you can see these are occurring, you know, every minute, every 30 seconds, leading up to about 10 minutes before lava broke the surface. And then you can clearly see uh, these sort of volcano tectonic events start coming in more rapidly and more strongly and becoming not even single events anymore. It's almost multiplets, uh, many events stacked on top of each other. And then the lava breaks the surface about 10 minutes after that activity picks up. 
And then even, you know, 15, 20 minutes after we had that strong, those strong VT multiplets occurring uh, before things really got sort of mixed together. So you still see in this in, in this time period, you know, about 15 minutes after lava broke the surface, you can see these sort of um, pulsing VT volcano tectonic multiplets on top of this band of tremor that began. I mean, we had geologists on the ground at that point. I mean, you know, they're seeing different vents pop up. There weren't just one vent where everything came out of. There's different vents. And the path is really trying to um, establish itself. This magma needs to establish a nice, least uh, low resistance path um, to reach the surface. And then you can see about 40 minutes after it was first seen on the surface, it really did establish its path. And you can see that nicely because you have less of this pulsing broadband sort of rock breaking activity and more of this steady low frequency sort of humming, this tremor, uh, which is a signature sort of signal you expect. Um, with material pouring out or, or liquid movement in here, we have an, an open vent that lava was pouring out of in the crater. Um, and then we'll focus on this, this event that occurred about an hour after lava reached the surface that most of us felt. I, I, I remember being slightly concerned when we first felt the shaking of this event, uh, but then we saw that it was it was a south flank event, um, which is expected um, and occurs often. Um, this event, you can see this map, it shows where the felt, the did you feel it reports were submitted from uh, very strongly on the east side of the island, really all around the big island, and then Maui and Molokai. I had a maximum Mercalli intensity of, of four, which indicates light shaking and really no damage. And I had about 620 did you feel it or reports. Um, it occurred at 6.3 kilometers depth. Uh, and that along with the sort of a shallow dipping fault plane really indicate uh, it occurred on the Dacoma, um, which is the detachment fault of the island sitting on top of the ocean floor. And we get a lot of events there. And here, if we sort of zoom in and focus on the East Rift, you can see a lot of these events occurring. Uh, these are now colored based on depths and they're occurring you know, from five to 13 uh, 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 kilometers below the surface. So um, that's that's about what we would expect for these Dacomon events. And you can see, you know, the rift is pretty clear right here, the east rift of Kilauea. And these events are happening south of that, um, and which is, is a pretty clear indicator. They're not migrating through the rift. These are really south flank sort of uh, that detachment um, faulting events. And then here, if we sort of focus and, and look at the lower East Rift, you see it's very quiet. There's really been no mi migrating activity out there. Few micro seismic events, a couple of moderately sized events, uh, which had a handful of felt reports, but very small and very quiet. Um, and over here, you can see we have this histogram. These are weekly counts. It stayed pretty consistent until the recent activity uh, with Kilauea Summit being as quiet as it is. It's really just mostly the south flank activity we're seeing over the past month. And then finally, the Pahala seismicity catches a lot of attention, including ours. Um, we're, we're focused on this area uh, because the, the activity has really picked up. Uh, but the activity stays at these 25 to 40 kilometers depths. Now you see some of the shallow activity up here, uh, but it's a very separate activity. You don't really see any migrating or shallowing right under Pahala. It's really just these deep events, uh, which past studies have linked that to um, sort of deep magma uh, upwelling, uh, maybe uh, where it comes into the volcanic edifice, the, the big island where it first enters from the, the sort of upper mantle area to the crust. Um, and if you, you can read more about that at this um, Volcano Watch that was written in 2019, and it'll talk slightly more about that. But again, this activity has been observed for decades and it did pick up in August, 2019 um but it stayed pretty consistent since then um so thank you very much uh, if you have questions please uh, feel free to email and, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible um and stay safe thank you hello again i hope you enjoyed that presentation about what's happening at kilauea volcano just a reminder activity is ongoing and things likely evolved from when this presentation was recorded in mid-January um, until the time that you're watching it. So please visit the HVO website for the latest information about the activity at Kilauea. Uh, there are regular updates on the activity. We have photo and video chronologies uh, for some unique perspectives on the activity and the interpretations. 
as well as live webcam feeds so you can see what things are like in real time. Um, I would also like to say that at this time, all activity from the current eruption is taking place within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. The lava lake itself is not currently visible from any safe viewing locations within the park, so please carefully follow the park's guidelines uh, to have the best and safest experience that you can. HVO is performing our critical monitoring activities within the closed area of the park, and we're doing this with permission and in close collaboration with park authorities. HVO field crews are also equipped with a full complement of specialized personal safety equipment and communications equipment uh, while we perform the, the volcano monitoring work as part of HVO's mission. Um, again, I would like to acknowledge Janet Babb for initiating Volcano Awareness Month, and we wish her a very happy and healthy retirement. I would also like to acknowledge Tina Neal, who served as HBO scientist in charge up until this past June. Um, and uh, she was in charge of HBO and the response throughout the dramatic events of 2018. And Tina sends her aloha from the Alaska Volcano Observatory where she is now. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the tremendous efforts and talents of Katie Mulligan, who organized and uh, made this year's uh, HVO Volcano Awareness Month activities possible. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Katie. A lot of work goes into these, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of an eruption. So mahalo, Katie. Happy Volcano Awareness Month to everyone. Happy New Year in general. Uh, please stay safe, take care, and stay aware. Aloha.